What's up, everybody? I'm The Hook. And I'm The Blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to The Blade Cast, <laughs> a show about all things. I'm your host, Lawson. <laughs> <laughs> With me, as always, is your other host, the one and only, Tim. <laughs> what? Hold on, can you introduce me a different way? <laughs> <laughs> what? How? I don't know, just not not that way. <laughs> what, you didn't like the little Tim? I just, you, you made me nervous. You were like the one and only, and it's like, oh, what do I say to that? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I, it's It must be hard to carry the unbearable weight of massive talent <laughs> on your shoulders. Of, no, of massive Tim. <laughs> Just big Tim energy on this episode of the podcast. <laughs> it's always that way. I know. The standard Pokemon book played. There's two parts. The hook and the blend. Hello, everybody. So today... <laughs> We've got a great episode for you guys. It's it's going to be great. It's going to be excellent. Some would even say... I'm excited. Some would even say that Lawson's excited. <laughs> so if you remember back, we did a previous uh, What If episode, basically just talking about some hypothetical things, some things that we knew about that kind of got cut and didn't happen. And we had a lot of fun going back and forth about things that could have been in Assassin's Creed. And so we said, fuck it, let's do it again. Yeah. Uh, this time, we are just going to focus a little bit more on things that were actually, like, kind of beyond a conceptual stage and removed late in the development. So no- nothing like Patrice saying that he want he wanted the kingdom to be, like, a hunting ground for you because that never made it out of the conceptual stage. That's just or even us idea. completely manufacturing a made up Wild West game that probably never existed. Well, the well, the caveat with that is like <laughs> we were talking about things that were like pre-production and maybe like was floated around, but these are things that were a little bit yeah. more concrete. This is like cut content type stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Things that were removed or switched around or saved for other games, etc. Uh just a couple notes at the top of the show. Some of these things are legitimized more than others, and I will as we go through, I will say which ones are like for certain that from the horse's mouth type deal. Some of these are a little bit more maybe left field. I'm not making any kind of a definitive statement about any of these things that aren't actually like, like as I said, from the horse's mouth. So any of these things that are a little strange. A point of clarification is the horse Ubisoft. Yes. Or, okay. or, or people. I've affiliated. never imagined Ubisoft as a horse before, but I'm kind of enjoying it. Or, <laughs> or people affiliated, people who actually worked in the game, an authoritative figure, if you will. An authoritative horse. Yeah. Our pet horse, Ubisoft. We can't call Eve up and be like, hey, man, is this true? So if any of this is just like super proved false, uh, I'm sorry. Leave us some hate mail. Also, I don't want to make any kind of definitive statements about why something got cut or why this didn't make it in the game. There are many moving pieces in these games. And, you know, like sometimes it's easy to attribute blame to Ubisoft because they do a lot of shit. But <laughs> sometimes it's no one's fault, you know. So and I, and I will get into why this is relevant later on. But, yeah, so that's really all I have to say. Um, Lawson, did you have anything to add? As far as like a note at the top of the show? I do love notes at the top of the show specifically. Yeah, we all do. We all do. But I don't really have anything. I'm kind of just, I'm just vibing. You're along for the ride. I'm going, I'm going with the flow <laughs> and I'm excited to see where it takes me. We're just going to start from AC1 and work our way down. These are some small details. To be honest, kind of had a hard time taking up some things about AC1. I did find though that apparently, and this is actually in the code of the game, uh, there was like a drop in co op mode. Yeah. I have actually seen. Some footage where someone was able to, like, connect a second controller and then, like, a ghostly Altair figure would pop up. Huh. Apparently, this was totally going to be a thing and they dropped it. It stayed within the code of the game somehow. I heard that. I, I remember, like, maybe an interview with Patrice or something that they talked about wanting to do co-op in the first Assassin's Creed. And that the reason they couldn't do it was because... Like split screen was just not effective because right. you need to have a lot of vertical oh, yeah. uh, awareness to be able to climb something or see where you're climbing. And you need a lot of horizontal awareness to interface with crowds. 
and and do effective sure. parkour. So it makes sense why like as as far as split screen goes, just wasn't feasible. That makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm wondering if it could have been more of like a not so much a split screen thing, but like a u- utilizing the Xbox Live features and in, in PS Online. Right. Uh, it's interesting though that they like that that they had this idea for the first game, and then Unity pops up so much later and does it. Uh, you know, I'm sure besides just like running around together, that, that, that there must be like a design thing where if you want to be running with your friend, there has to be a thing where they didn't build parkour situations or like parkour routes made for like two people to be alongside each other you know it was more of just you solo maybe yeah i don't know so this is probably the most speculatory thing on the list i really just found it while i was perusing the the wiki it says that constantinople was in the game or was supposed to be that kind of is on the edge though of like conceptual so i just wanted to mention it because honestly finding things that were cut in this game is very hard because it seems like there (laughs) wasn't a lot that we know of uh you know of course there's the crossbow thing that was clearly in in the game but that you know that's minor uh some other things like like uh you could ride a horse within the cities that's actually present in a demo that you can watch weird how that didn't make it in the ac2 either you also had not only a gentle push function, but you had an ability to shove citizens like guards can do to you if you get too close to them. Oh. So gentle push is still a thing, but then you can shove them, I guess, with a different, like probably high high profile and gentle Probably push. high profile B. Yes. And so that would have been very useful for beggars. So moving on to AC2, you are not unaware of this. We've talked about this a little bit before, but this is a great way for us to expand on it. Uh, so AC2... Uh, and this is in a this is in an Assassin's Creed dev diary. You can look it up on YouTube, and it's totally available. So this is legitimized. It was originally supposed to end in 1503. Coincidentally, when Rodrigo Borgia was to die, totally did not was not supposed to end where it was. And I've read that there was a little sliver of Rome that was actually playable, not just the part that you run through to get to Rodrigo. So, um, which wait, which hmm. makes sense because I actually just uh, recently finished AC2 again, and it does look like there's a good chunk of the city that is built yeah you know we talked about the whole relationship between ac2 and brotherhood in, in, the, in the last what if episode mm-hmm. what's most interesting to me is the idea of when in development it became the plan like was it simply a case of oh we couldn't get rome in ac2 to work the way we wanted it to so we had to cut some content and then later they go hey we want another assassin's creed Ezio game this next year do you think you can finesse it with what you left over or alternatively if as they were making ac2 they started to have ideas for what would become brotherhood and they were like oh you know what we could do a whole game out of this so let's stop doing it in ac2 and let's save it for later i suspect the former just because i feel like the sales of ac2 led to that decision i feel like i heard that somewhere like it sold so well that they were like hurry guys all hands on deck we got to <laughs> shit out another Ezio game next year <laughs> but i don't know you know i i'm also curious too because i'm wondering if they just had like a really good response to like play testing with Ezio as well that's also possible right like all the play testers just start like leaving jizz stains on their controllers yeah exactly and then management starts going maybe we're onto something <laughs> People really like that Leonardo da Vinci guy. <laughs> Someone's having a breakdown in the lunchroom. I think they forgot to hug Leonardo. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look. <laughs> there, look, there's totally like bits. Like we know that like the DLC that that's actually in the game was not supposed. It was supposed to be in the game on the disc. Like it's on the disc, you know, yeah. they just unlock it for you. Fucking so, shitty ass doofy dlc ac2 might have the most cut content because it had the most things that were actually on the game that they just didn't use which i wonder why it of all the games when you if you take all the things that were supposed to be in the game and you just put them in the game how ambitious and unruly and fucking huge of a game is that still probably only like 10 percent the runtime of valhalla but i can't imagine the pacing of that game with all that extra stuff in it yeah, I mean, ending even further into 1503, and if you include the missing sequences, that's a long game. But still, not even, like you said, not even close to as long as Valhalla. Yeah. I, I read that there's apparently this uh, part of Venice that was supposed to be playable. There is a part of Venice that you can see off in the distance. It's 
It's kind of low res, but it's there. That was apparently supposed to also be playable. I mean, the thing that's most interesting to me about the 1503 date yeah. is if that was what was originally intended, then still, though, I, I think that if AC2 had ended where everyone intended it originally, we probably wouldn't see Ezio ever again. That's a good point. And I think that it's interesting how... I mean, that Dev Diary video you're talking about, I don't know when that came out in the hype cycle for AC2, but the fact that they were talking in the video, like, the game ends in 1503, it had mm-hmm. to be a decision that was made very late in the game. And I'm curious about that, you know? like Yeah, I mean, because that, that's the thing, is a Dev Diary isn't, like, it's not something you put out after the game comes out. Right. Okay, so uh, I just looked at the date. It's October 22nd, 2009. For those who are unaware or who may need a refresher of this, it's the Assassin's Creed Dev Diary number five, where they talk about Ezio and Corey May is like, our game begins in 1401 and ends in 1503. <laughs> Famed Leo K lookalike Corey May. <laughs> Dude, it is uncanny how, how similar they look. <laughs> it really is. I think is. that Leo K is just Corey May and he's, he's, he's hiding. <laughs> It explains a lot. It explains a lot is all I'm saying. Yeah, it explains how brilliant and smart <laughs> and handsome <laughs> he is. <laughs> so it is interesting to think about like what would have happened to Ezio. I still think that, a, that ending it in 1503, though, would have made a, a more conclusive story. The way it ends now, it, it clearly seems like a, like a cut and a rewrite. Yeah, we've, we've talked about how the ending of AC2 is actually pretty weak, all things considered. As far as it's, character it's stuff goes. It's pretty whack. And, it's pretty whack. Like, when you really think about it, uh, does it make sense? No, not and really. it makes sense now that they're like, that, that that wasn't the original intention. It was supposed to go much further with Rodrigo, so... I funnily enough, I don't have a Brotherhood section on this list because Brotherhood is just cut cut content from AC2. There's nothing cut from Brotherhood <laughs> that we could talk about. <laughs> Actually, in Brotherhood, they had this whole section where you're going to uh, uh, fast forward into the future and play in French Revolution Paris as a whole different character named Arno. But that actually got cut and turned into a whole different game. <laughs> <laughs> that got cut and turned into AC3. <laughs> so uh, for Revelations. Um, there's just there is one interesting detail that I wanted to talk about. Ooh. So going back to the Constantinople for AC1 comment, supposedly there was supposed to be some Constantinople gameplay as Altair, and that would have been a really easy like re- reuse of assets and stuff. So I, I totally uh. see that having happened. Oh, like they would. Uh, okay, like you're playing as Altair, but it's Constantinople, but it's like you know 1100s instead of. 1500 right and so back so back in into the, like some of the original stuff that i read apparently like the sack of constantinople happens in 1204 and that would have lined up perfectly with altair um and we know from like expanded universe stuff that altair made a trip to constantinople but was unsuccessful in planting a bureau there so it completely line up with with things like the secret crusade and everything because you could just reuse the conscious and opal assets and just don't give them the hook blade they did that yeah. with the masia stuff anyway exactly would have been pretty cash money yeah there's some other things you know a little bit more speculatory about how like animus island was supposed to be uh, a little bit more like spooky and how lost and how the, like the desmond's journey was supposed to be a different concept not like the first person portal stuff um i can't validate any of that I'm trying to imagine a spookier Animus Island, and I feel like it could have actually worked really well. I wonder why yeah. they moved away from that. All things considered, Animus Island's actually pretty bright and colorful. It's very Tron-like. Yeah, it's not like it's not like, ooh, this is scary. So like they, they could have really turned up the the spook. Clay wasn't gonna be just like a normal body talking to him. It was gonna be also like Kind of, kind of reminiscent of how we saw him in AC2 and Brotherhood, just this kind of like spooky figure uh, looming over Desmond in Animus Island. Mm. And apparently this was going to be how Desmond learned the actual truth about uh, Lucy and everything. And so he was going to like be like, hey, Desmond, uh, Lucy, uh, she's Templar. Lucy was a, hey, Lucy was a Templar. <laughs> and then he'd be like, <gasps> Fuck! Yeah. So. And he'd be like, oh, I guess it's good I killed her then. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's good that I sliced her that I sliced her bitch ass up. Good thing I stabbed her in the belly, dude. <laughs> dude. Whoa, nice one, dude. <laughs> oh, 
Dude, you killed a Templar? That's so sick. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> what interests me about that, I mean, first of all, yeah, one of the big failings of Revelations is that one of the key revelations was not put into the story of the main game. It would have been confusing, I think, maybe hard to justify, like, how does Clay know Lucy was a Templar? Ha, ha, ha. Who knows? At the same time, though, right? what's actually strikes me as the biggest reason we didn't get spooky animus Island is something that Darby McDevitt said to us said to you on Twitter this past week, because, uh, you actually, you tweeted at him with the clip of, uh, in our revelations episode, episode 14, where I talked about how clay is sort of a thematic reflection of Ezio and that he realizes that his greater purpose in life is he's just got to help Desmond save the world and that he's not the chosen one. And Darby was like, yeah, he he said he built the narrative of every character, every main character in Revelations around the idea that they would have to realize by the end of the story the exact extent of what they could accomplish with their life. And right. if Clay Kazmarek is going to be a sinister, spooky computer ghost, it's a little bit harder to humanize him to the point of being the guy that you see in that like like how do you earn that moment in the end of him you know sacrificing himself for desmond if up until now he's been a creepy ghost boy right it's probably safe to assume that that was more conceptual than anything perhaps yeah i i I don't see how you can validate him as a main character um and not use him that way and clearly i mean like these decisions had to have been made very quickly yeah because they clearly had Clay voiced and acted and stuff. So it's not like this was a last minute decision or anything. Right. We're we're starting slow with a lot of these, but trust me, the snowball is just getting bigger. With AC3, AC3 also probably rivals AC2 with cut content, but we just yeah. don't know about any of it. What we do know, uh, there's some very slight gameplay things, a very popular AC3, like this was actually like, within like screenshots of the game that were released. You had you you had a canoe. You could use a canoe to travel. Cool, I guess. Apparently, if we're talking about how Brotherhood was like AC two table scraps, even Black Black Flag pulled a lot from AC three as well. Apparently, there was going to be naval free room so that Connor could just get on the uh, what was it? Oh, the the Aquila. Yeah, the a- and yeah, just Aquila. kind of free roam in, in that area. So. Totally makes sense how they were kind of working on that system and then just brought it over to AC4. Yeah. Apparently, Philadelphia was going to be in the game, but the architecture just didn't work, which for as well as the other architecture <laughs> in this game works, it must have been pretty fucking bad. It must have been pretty fucking bad, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been pretty shitty. <laughs> that would have been cool, you know? Uh, another, I think another city location would have been interesting. That's the thing, right? Is like I, I can appreciate when it's like, hey, yeah, like this this city wouldn't work for Assassin's Creed, but they obviously stopped caring about that a long time ago. <laughs> like, why why just put fit like why can't you just do Philly and then design it in a way where it's maybe not super one to one, but it's still is functional. Yeah, that's the thing. It's exactly your point. It's like Boston and New York already suck to parkour through. So how bad could Philadelphia have really right. been? And also just I mean, yeah, that whole generation of games until Rogue was a little bit just not great as far for as sure. parkour and and city design experience go. But it's really interesting how, like, if Rogue's New York and AC3's New York can both be considered viable by the Assassin's Creed franchise and both be considered, like, this is true enough to the architecture that we're comfortable with designing it this way. As a completely clueless dummy, I don't know what it is about Philadelphia that made it undoable about rogues new york too like the thing is is they're not drastically different cities one's just designed better right so it's it's weird how they how they could make a few changes and have i think an actually like solid design structure and so make it to make it parkour friendly if it can be done with ac3's new york to such a degree i could have seen like rogue having philadelphia and it being the same situation right i wanted to check since we were talking about it and see if there was a reason that was given because I remember Noah, mm-hmm. uh, Noah commented on our last What If episode about that exact thing, 
about Philadelphia. Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, he, he said, what if AC3 had Philadelphia? E3 footage shows Connor killing Silas, who was killed in sequence two by Hatham in 1776. Connor goes to Philly multiple times. There's special map marker assets for it. And even the map of the hmm. frontier goes south to accommodate having a third major city. It really appears that oh, Philly being wow. cut due to technical issues is what caused Hatham to exist and the poor pacing throughout. Wow. Okay. That's that's really interesting because right yeah because it does kind of feel lacking with just the two cities right like I think Philadelphia would have rounded it rounded it out a little bit especially when you consider if that leads to the whole Hatham idea that's like a really big change oh yeah I mean that that's the that's the like first three sequences of your story <laughs> gone for Hatham that's interesting so there are if there are actually assets in the game then that's totally like yeah Philly was gonna be there and they just cut it it's probably pretty late cut maybe yeah that's that's really interesting to me how I'm, I'm i'm really curious about what about philadelphia specifically was was like so terrible like that yeah and in, a, in a way that new york and boston weren't um, <laughs> wait you're telling me the ac3 team had standards <laughs> you're, wait, wait. you're telling me the ac3 team couldn't make a city <laughs> um some slight things like everyone knows connor was supposed to be able to scalp people that turned out not to be too appropriate for his tribe. Yeah, that is that that is seen, you know, in like the target gameplay and whatnot. So that that seemingly was a little bit of a late change. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sad that it's gone. Who, who cares? But interestingly enough, apparently the hook blade, not the hook blade. What the fuck am I saying? The rope dart was apparently uh, actually just supposed to be in. I actually have concept art of this. It's actually the hook, uh, the the hook blade. Jesus, God the damn it, dude! Rope dart. Get the, the hook the blade out of your brain. The the rope dart was supposed to be actually like attached to the hidden blade and was called the chain blade. Chain blade. So you would shoot it out and yeah, whatever. Like and they, I guess they thought it was a little too fantastical, so they cut it. Which they could have. They should have just done that with. You know what I'm gonna say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, rope launcher. Yeah. Why are there, why there's no yeah. combat application for the fucking rope launcher blows my mind. You're telling me the assassins have the rope launcher on their wrist and would never fucking shoot it into a human being? Seriously? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it could literally just function as a rope dart in combat. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> as we know, the best AC gadgets kind of bleed out into all other aspects of the game. The hook blade yeah. affects navigation and combat both, and that's why it's so effective. Yeah. And that's why it's the best gadget. In the series. <laughs> Moving on to AC4. Now we are getting into the into the juice, into the meat. Because <laughs> now we're getting into the good shit. I had to I had to peter through about fucking co-op and scalping <laughs> just to round out this list. Now we're in the end game, baby. I can't wait. So with AC4, this is really interesting. Uh, and this is from the horse's mouth, meaning the Darby horse. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know if you know this. AC4 had a cut sequence. Darby says this was kind of late in the writing process, but not so much when they started development. There was supposed to be a sequence after Edward is betrayed by Roberts. He goes directly back to Mary Reed. And he's like, look, listen, I fucked up. I'll help you find the sage because he betrayed me. He's not a nice guy. And this would then lead into a, uh, and I'm sure like Noah can comment on this. I have no idea. Um, but... This, this would lead into like an actually like historical accurate time where Mary Reed and Anne Bonny were fighting the British and Edward would be a part of that. Oh. And so this actually would have led straight into how Edward was captured with Mary and Anne, how they ended up at the same prison. Okay. So the idea is that Edward would have went to help Mary and then Edward, Mary and Anne would have been on this kind of little escapade. Then they would have gotten captured by the British and that's how Edward would have been thrown in jail with Mary. And Darby said that he wanted to take this opportunity f to have Mary scold Edward while they're in jail together. Hmm. You know, so so that way, like, that's kind of where Edward's, like, I guess, come to Jesus moment happens. So that that's kind of interesting because that, that kind of would have really set things up for the finale in a different way, right? Totally, yeah. I, th I can see all the reasons why that would have been a great sequence and and could have maybe helped the the sort of connecting tissue like a to b of getting edward into that prison and absolutely having that moment at the same time it's one of those things that like i'm not desperate for the version of ac4 where that's included because they still managed to make everything work really well 
Yeah, for sure. And it is interesting, though, too, because for me, probably, I would have liked a sequence like this a little bit more because I felt like Edward's relationship with Mary kind of ended a little too abruptly. I wanted to see more of them together. This would have satisfied that. I think that's true. I think they're, they're, that I would have liked to see more with them. I think it's a testament to how strong the interactions that they do have are that I still felt, you know, that that connection and that attachment. Right. But I would not have said no to a, a, an opportunity to flesh them out more. It's interesting to think, too, because the way it happens in AC4 is Edward gets betrayed by Roberts. He, he gets out of the observatory, but he's injured, and Roberts just sells him off, and then he ends up at the same jail as Mary. Yeah. It, I totally would have preferred him getting betrayed, escaping, you know, and then Mary kind of puts trust in him, and then Edward fucks it up somehow. And then he gets, you know, then he gets chewed out by her in prison, and then he's like, wow, like I've put you both in danger now for my own selfishness. The other nice thing about it is that it sets. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. <laughs> the other nice thing about it is that it actually adds another node on the path to assassin because presumably if he's helping Mary Reed, he's helping her in the context of she's trying to get Bartholomew Roberts for the sake of the assassins. So he's now doing exactly. something for the assassins, even though critically, He's mostly just doing it for revenge. And that's another great sort of like, you know, you line up what his right. motives are and what the assassin's motives are. It would probably be the first time in the game that they're aligned, but you see that he's still doing it for the wrong reasons, which makes his for choice sure. to actually join and actually help for the right reasons even that much more impactful. So it's a great idea. Yeah, for sure. And I think it could have provided us a little bit more attention to Edward, like slowly kind of like digging the uh, assassin ideology, like, like maybe him and Mary could have conversations and he's like, you know what? I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. And ultimately what you know, the, the final straw is them getting in jail. And Edward then realizes when fucking Mary is like about to die in prison, partly because of something that he did, that would have been really impactful. Yeah. Being with Mary leading up to her death, that would have been really hard on, on everyone so i i'm sad that it didn't make it in obviously you know it works without it darby says that they kind of would have like gone back to nassau in, the, in this process and darby says that nassau was kind of used too much they wanted to go back to kingston and whatnot so that was also a part of the reason why he said that it was good that it got cut ultimately yeah but he he, he did want this to happen because he really liked that historical point like with mary and Anne. And the funny and the, and the cool thing about it, too, is like Mary isn't a pirate. She's an assassin who's using the pirates for cover. Right. So it would have been really interesting to see like how what what she's doing on these pirate missions that uh, that are different than everyone else and how she's kind of getting Anne to accept some of the ideology, perhaps. Anyway, last thing about AC4. So you know how at the end of AC4, uh, Edward, you know, goes on these little assassination missions. Darby says that. He was really, they all really liked about how AC1 had the investigate and then assassinate feature. And so some of the final assassination missions were going to be more about uh, investigate than assassinate. So that would have been cool just to get more Edward assassiny things. But ultimately, you know, I think the assassination still work fine. Yeah. And some of them in the end kind of do end up working like that. Well, well, the, the overabundance of tailing missions really makes me think the whole investigate assassinate thing would have just been more tailing missions. So no thanks. That's a good point. Yeah. So that's pretty much the biggest thing that Darby says was cut. So uh, there you go. So moving on. Now we're getting to even more of the good shit. Uh, now, we're in, now we're at Unity. Nothing for Rogue? No. Fuck Rogue. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the, apparently there were, there were, I was going to add a, a section for Rogue, but every detail that I found was just people like beating around the bush about what was actually cut. So interesting. Uh, apparently there was a couple sequences cut. There was actually a whole introductory part of the game that was going to be in a different location, but they cut it and they couldn't talk about it. So they didn't <laughs> give any details about it. So eh, there you go. I don't know why I've never mentioned this before. Cause I, I knew this. I just got reminded about it in this process for Unity. Take a guess who was supposed to write it originally. Um, who came up with the first treatment? Take a guess. The first treatment uh, of Unity? Yes. Jeffrey O'Hala? Yes. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. Yep. So uh, <laughs> did, did you know that or was that it was an actual guess? Um, well, I just guessed because I know that Unity started development right after Brotherhood and Yohalem wrote Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So he might have been 
involved in that. Okay, so yeah, there's some interesting stuff there. So Yohalem was a, was around for Unity, like he was gonna write Unity pretty much. Yeah. He eventually left to do Child of Light. He's very vague about why that was. So could have been because of some of the things I'm gonna mention here. I'll go back to Yohalem. But you know, the whole like Amancio timeline is really is really interesting because he came off of Revelations and he was like, I guess I'll do your Unity game. Then apparently he left Ubisoft entirely, which we know. He didn't come back to Ubisoft until 2012. Uh, and Ancio got on the project and then left Ubisoft and then came back in 2012. So he started on Unity after Revelations? Yeah, so the way that he explains it, who fucking knows if this is what actually happened? The way that he explains it is that they offered him Unity and he was like, well, I gotta do Revelations. Because Unity started right around after Brotherhood. And so Amancio was busy with Revelations. And then after Revelations finished, apparently, you know, he just pretty much fucked off and left the company. Right. He didn't come back until 2012. He had to go soul searching and face licking. Yes, exactly. But 2012 wasn't that much longer after Revelations happened. But like to think that like how how much was he was he actually involved in this project? <laughs> let's say he worked on it for two years tirelessly like with how long unity was actually in development like that that's that's a drop in the bucket right right yeah who, yeah that's kind of an interesting point like do we know who was running the ship before amancio no uh in terms of creative direction no i don't right but to go back to yohalem so yohalem and this is from the horse's mouth I need to stop saying that. I need to stop saying that. <laughs> Look, there's too many horses and too many mouths in this podcast, yeah. Tim. The, the, this is from the Yohalem mouth himself. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so the original pitch for Unity, it was inspired by a movie called Red Violin. Are you familiar with this movie? Not even a little bit. So the Red Violin is a movie about a violin, believe it or not. Whoa. And it's red. It follows from when it was first crafted, and then it, and then it follows it between owners throughout 100 years, 200 years. Hmm. Do I know I've ever seen the movie? Not at all. But that was Yohalem's inspiration. And so basically what we can assume is that it was going to follow presumably the Sword of Eden throughout all these time periods. And the time anomalies within Unity were actually from that original concept of the Unity prologue is an example of a part of this surviving. The Unity prologue like was going to be like the first section of the Sword of Eden ownership thing. And the thing is, is that each owner dies after they you know like like, uh, each owner ends up dying so that's why your prologue guy dies that's why arno was supposed to die wow and so that was the big question that you halen was was saying is like should arno live or die and so that was the thing it was going to pass owners and so then that makes you look at the time anomalies in a whole different light because that means you would have had the prologue which probably would have had more medieval paris action going then you have French Revolution, Arno time period. You have World War II. You have the Statue of Liberty being built in Paris. So theoretically, we would have had a unity that took place over a huge span of time following a, a piece of Eden through, through all of its uh, owners. And the thing that is really cool to me is that that could have translated into a modern day story. So obviously, like, look, that's very ambitious. And for all the things that unity wanted to do, you know, like, could that have actually happened who knows that was part of why i gave the preface earlier is like you halem apparently like while you halem was on the project this stuff got changed so was that the reason why he left a child of light perhaps was it was it maybe his decision to change these things maybe i don't want to attribute blame to one person you know it could have been you halem changing his mind but it's probably not that one thing i could speculate on is that if they're trying to you know because there's this whole narrative that sprung up where a lot of the choices that it seemed like they made about like player progression and RPG esque character building in unity directly followed on from the data they were getting for how effective the RPG ship mechanics in AC four were that people were staying in the game hmm. in black flag just to level up their ships and, and fight more legendary battles and stuff like that. So Maybe they get that data. They make that decision that like, well, let's let's apply that to the character. Maybe that goes hand in hand with the whole co-op idea of, you know, like you've talked about customizing and specializing your character so you can differentiate it from the other people you're playing with. That would all be very hard to make work in that red violin context because you can't really level up a character if the game has four main characters because it jumps through time periods. Correct. Right. Yeah. So that could have been part of it. I don't know. The, the reason why, the reason why this, I think, I, I feel like this gets a pass 
because it is conce- like it is conceptual to the point where it didn't make it past like the first treatment. Yeah. However, there are remnants of it in the game. We yeah. have the time anomalies. They became something else, but like the Unity prologue was we were probably going to play as that guy, you know, until he died. It was probably going to be more than just a mission. It was probably going to be a sequence, you know? I um, mean, and that and that totally makes sense for all like the assets they built for the time anomalies stuff. I, I know that you are, are particularly like you really want to see a, a, an, an Assassin's Creed game that takes place over many different eras. Yeah, that's what I've been wanting to see. And uh, our friend Blue as well. That's something that I listened to right. one of the episodes of his podcast over on Overly Sarcastic Productions, their new podcast. He has the, he was talking about having the exact same thing he wants to see where um, he was specifically talking in the context of like a like a an Asian setting like in China or Japan. I've always talked about it in the context of Russia, of going between like Russian Revolution and Cold War era Russia, and maybe even long before that. Right. But that being like something they wanted to do for Unity and the fact that like we've got the we got the sort of exploration of that a little bit with the World War One rift and syndicate. And you had actually you right. sent me a, a link a while ago to an interview with Corey May back in the day. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about that being something that he wants to do with Assassin's Creed in the future, way back when he was still right. really involved with the brand. And we, we know that Yohalem and Corey May are like close, like they, like they were friends in the series and they worked together a lot. So this could have been something that like the, the two of them were theorizing together, you know? I, it gives me like a little bit of hope that maybe one day they'll return to that idea now that they have more like next gen capabilities and stuff. For sure. Because it would be, I think, the best way to match the scope of some of the recent Assassin's Creed games while still focusing on, uh, you know, a parkourable urban environment. Because you can give us one yeah, big, beautiful city sure. over three time periods. And it could be a case where, you know, that's three separate maps. And if you stitch them all together, you get something bigger than Valhalla's England. I hope not, but possibly, you know, since it seems like that's something they care about. Throughout the eras, you could do things like, let's say that there was a bridge there that wasn't built before, and now you have new parkour opportunities. That could totally be a feature. Yeah. You could you could progress linearly through the story. You go from the past to the future. For sure. And, and look, I mean, Ubisoft, clearly, like, if they're like, no, but we want to do Elise, you know, that could have also tampered with the whole idea that you're going to have multiple characters, because how can you have a fruitful relationship arc if you are moving beyond all these characters so frequently but apparently uh so within dead kings leon the little boy apparently he was supposed to be actually he like originally he was going to be in unity as like arno's little companion yeah that would have been really interesting to me because that would have been dope there's not a whole there's not a whole lot of like child presence in ac it would have been interesting to, to give arno who has daddy issues uh, <laughs> a little a little son figure you know two daddy issues yeah he has multiple daddy issues <laughs> at least yeah i think that would have been interesting especially if if that was ever involved in tandem with the original vision if one of the characters in the future timeline is the well, is a kid in one yes. timeline and the main character in, in another. Yes, timeline. <laughs> yes, that, yeah. You are you are you are right on the money with that one because that's totally what they could have done with it. Yeah. Like they could have had Leon like play, you, then you play as Leon as a man in a later era. And he's like, look at my cool assassin robes I got from my not dad. <laughs> yeah, it's like Arno's like here, take the sword of Eden and. <laughs> Take the sword and then he dies with it. <laughs> I'm dead um, now. Goodbye. I, I think it would have been really cool to see that happen. Um, the, the anomalies are some of the best parts of Unity. Would have been cool if there was actually story attached to it. And like you said, we get that we get that itch scratched with syndicates. So it's not all lost, you know? Right. That It's funny, though, to think about, right? Because the time anomalies thing, like the black box era and whatnot, like that was all like Unity and Syndicate. And they're just like, See you later. The time anomaly thing could have been really awesome if they developed it more. And that's also why like the eventual third game to the Revolution trilogy could have really like been the revelations in that sense and took all these things and made them into like one holistic experience. Which reminds me of a feature that I've been excited to introduce to the podcast, Tim Anomalies. You just dropped the Me e. from different time periods. Tim anomalies. Yeah, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll have alternate pathways through the podcast 
based on Tim saying different things. <laughs> you can choose your own Tim in the episode. Yeah, choose your own Tim. So uh, which Tim do you want to hear? Angry Tim, sarcastic Tim. You have chosen Italian Tim. <laughs> Oi, that's a good <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> I don't think that was Italian at all. <laughs> <laughs> you have chosen French Tim. Oi, that's a really good. That's a really good piece of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, all right. So you like my cafe teatro? <laughs> all right, moving on to syndicate. Uh, this is last on the list um, that I have. Lawson? Yeah. Pop quiz. Who also wrote Syndicate? <laughs> uh, 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 can I choose a different Tim? <laughs> Wrong. Uh, it was it was Jeffrey Yohalem. Jeffrey um, Yohalem. This made it really easy for me to dig up things about Unity and Syndicate all at once. Straight from the Yohalem's mouth. Straight from the Yohalem's horse. Did you know no. that there was supposed to be a playable modern day in Syndicate? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, for those that didn't, uh, <laughs> there was originally going to be a playable section of modern day. Got cut. I will send you the concept art of how you would interact with it in the open world so that you could like throw it up on the screen or whatever. Ooh. Um, but yeah, there was going to be like little phone booths that you could enter and then go into the modern day. And so the modern day gameplay would have been alongside the story that we got. So it's not like we were going to get a different story. It just would have been playable. So we would have been able to escape with Rebecca or Sean, or maybe even just play as Rebecca. That would have been interesting. That would have been cool. Or Galena. That was a feature. They, they, they couldn't end up doing it, unfortunately, but there was going to be playable modern day. Ultimately, though, that's the thing, is we love Syndicate's modern day. Everyone knows that. And it's not playable, so that's not the, that's, that's not the determining factor, really, of a good modern day anymore. Yeah, it's not the end of the world. For sure. This is something that... You 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 actually like kind of uncovered on Twitter with one of the guys who worked on it. Like we know that the, like the time anomaly and syndicate would have been more right. Like they, they they cut a lot of it because of because it featured a woman. Yeah yeah, it was Justin Farron. I think I talked about it on the podcast at one point. Right, where he worked for Ubisoft Singapore and they were talking about the World War One rift and they had a lot of difficulties with the editorial department at Ubisoft because. You know, they literally like asked Singapore, like, can you give us a version of Lydia Fry that is a man? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, do we have can you give to? Give us a version of Lydia Fry that's less feminine. <laughs> <laughs> what if we just turn down the female slider on this Lydia Fry? <laughs> it is interesting to think that it would have been like much longer than it is now. It seemed to have been like a battle to even get it to where it is, right? Yeah. The open world was going to be a lot more uh, like dynamic. So we talk a lot about actually about how Jacob it kind of just destroys things and then Evie has to clean up. Almost immediately, though, is, is what is what happens in the game, though, we would have seen like adverse effects of these things within the open world itself. So we would have seen things at the store, like consumables and whatnot, would be astronomically priced because of inflation. Uh, we would have seen guards all over the place. Uh, we would have seen the transportation systems break down, and then you can't fast travel anymore. And that would have all happened as, like, side effects of Jacob fucking things up? Yes. Damn. So that so that would have been present within the open world. And then here's the, here's the thing. This is how you're handling it. Sounds so it. cool. <laughs> you could... Just say fuck it and not clean things up as Evie. But to unlock the final sequence, it, you you have to clean up certain things as Evie. It does kind of mandate that you play as Evie, but it's also cool that you could just leave it fucked up for the whole game, right? Like, yeah, I mean that's interesting because I feel like what that allows you to do is it allows you to sort of set your own difficulty with it. Like, right. as someone who I never use fast travel, I might have just left that alone, but. If I started not enjoying having to spend more on consumables, then I would have maybe wanted to step in and fix things as Eevee. And the reason right. I think that this is so fucking cool of an idea is, as you know, Tim, something that, that I always talk about is I'm a huge slut for whenever the gameplay circumstances directly tie into the narrative. So when the right. world changes because of progress in the narrative in a way that actually affects the gameplay of the game, that... That 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 really excites me. 
I can see how it's a slippery slope, though, because, all right, what if you have the player who fucks up everything before cleaning anything up? How hostile is the world towards him now, him or her, playing the game, that everything is broken and nothing is yet fixed? How difficult does that make the remaining missions and, and the remaining progress in the game? I can see right. the consequences yeah. of that, but I, it's something that like it would have been a really easy way to innovate on the narrative of that game with the tools that they already had of the actual setup of you know the engine and the gameplay and all of that. That would have been like a little sprinkle of innovation on top that might have really elevated the the whole game. That's the thing is they kind of would have been slightly ahead of the curve of like these dynamic open worlds too because. That, 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 that's all the rage right now. And, you know, look, open worlds can always benefit from being more dynamic. And it's really interesting to think that not only, yeah, would your like with the narrative tie into the world, but it also kind of gives you the power to correct it as well. I, I, I appreciate how they don't just give it an optional thing. Like, like you, yes, you're going to need to repair London. You can't just leave it broken forever and finish the game that way. So yeah. I, I do like how it's not completely optional, but I also like how they, we're going to give you the option to wait until the final sequence, but they're still not saying that like you could just fuck up London and never repair it as Evie, you know? Yeah. It would also give stakes to Evie's actions too, because Evie would have to be doubly careful not to screw things up even more, which yeah. speaks to her personality. That was the narrative device in Syndicate that I appreciated. I loved that sort of back and forth between right. Jacob and Evie. It's just that feeling the gameplay side effects of that progression could have made it even more, you know. Made, it, it would have made a lot more people dislike Jacob, probably. Which would have been fair and deserved. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it would have been interesting if that was going to lead into like a Jacob redemption thing. Where perhaps at the end of the game they team up to fix things together. And Jacob realizes his buffoonery. Which right. is kind of what happens, right? Which kind of what happens. Because instead, what happens, right, is it's kind of like a, a milk toast version of this, where Jacob yeah. does something, and then Evie will call him out on it, but she still just cleans up his mess, and then they kind of move on. Like, I, I feel like if Jacob himself was seeing, like, I don't know, fucking people, like, starving in the streets, like, because of him, you know, or, or if he saw people, like, getting, you know, like, not able to get to work because of him or something, then that would give Jacob some self-reflection, right? Totally. Because if, if everything's super high, hyperinflated, you can't can't buy anything. People are going to go hungry. And so Jacob is actually making things worse when he thinks in his, you know, in his man child brain that he's making things better. Yeah. Um, that would have been some really interesting, like introspective stuff that J that Jacob could have done in tandem with Evie calling him a moron and fixing his shit. Because at the end of the day, Evie does love Jacob. And so she wants him to do better. And that could have been a really interesting relationship. Hundred percent. Not to not to say that their, their relationship doesn't exist now. They clearly have a relationship in the game. And I've read a lot of fan fiction where their relationship gets even more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> That's all I have for cut content. Uh, oh, shit. Hold on. Hello? You there? Okay. Hey, I'm here. Uh, drop, drop my phone. Oh, uh, no. No, it's okay. It landed on the back. Uh, That's all I have for cut content. So... I feel like there's a lot of interesting stuff there. There was one thing I wanted to mention in our last What If episode that completely passed me by that I want to just throw in now. Go for it. There was at one point they were considering, at least in like the marketing branding department of things, that Assassin's Creed Odyssey was not going to be Assassin's Creed Odyssey or uh, Assassin's Creed. Odyssey and Assassin's Creed yeah, Adventure. Yeah, Odyssey and Assassin's Creed Adventure. You can see... Uh, some of the concept branding for that. And I feel like that would have been really interesting because it might have actually alleviated a lot of the complaints people had about Odyssey. I feel like if you looked at it through the lens of being a spinoff and not expecting to see Assassin's Creed stuff in it, that maybe you could have actually experienced it in, in the way that the developers presumably intended it to be experienced could have been interesting, but I also see why it's risky move because you don't know necessarily is the Assassin's Creed brand strong enough to support a spinoff of that nature. Right. It's interesting because that would also make them all the more ignorable. Yes. If Odyssey was coming out and it was an Assassin's Creed adventure, I know to fucking ignore all of that shit and just not bother with it. And that would have given Ubisoft, and like you've, you've mentioned this before, we, we talked about how uh, like, if they ever did a Templar game again. 
Yeah. And if they did a Templar spinoff, you were saying how that could have how that how that could have been their way of embracing very non-traditional AC gameplay and still kind of set it in the Assassin's Creed universe. So I think a similar effect could have taken place here where Odyssey could have been Odyssey and, and Origins and Valhalla and all they all could have been their games. They could have been these little spin-offs. Yeah, I wonder. I mean I feel like the the reality that we're in right now is that we're just getting these in Assassin's Creed Adventure games, but they're being sold to us as mainline traditional AC titles. And I feel like it would be more beneficial for us if there was at least that little subtitle in Assassin's Creed ad- event. Because, like, look, you go to any Ubisoft tweet about Assassin's Creed now, and there's someone underneath it saying, why are you calling these Assassin's Creed still? Like, I feel like people would still see the Assassin's Creed adventure and still just go buy it, you know? Like, I, I don't I don't know if they would... I don't know if it would impact sales as much as... But look, clearly there was a decision made that changed it to Assassin's Creed Odyssey over Odyssey and Assassin's Creed Adventure. So there very well could be some market research that suggests that that subtitle doesn't work. But I do think that as far as our our perspective is concerned as, as hardcore fans, that it would have given some much needed separation. Like even when I was just playing around with Immortals Phoenix Rising a bit, I was like, it's crazy how much more palatable some of the Odyssey design choices are when they're not infecting my Assassin's Creed. Absolutely. <laughs> like this combat is actually pretty fun when I'm not expecting right. Assassin's Creed. If they're more ignorable than, then you could even like them more. Yeah. It is interesting to think like, would that have actually split the games up or would we have just gotten an Odyssey and Assassin's Creed adventure and then Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Yeah, you, you, you kind of, you start to wonder how many ideas for games have they had or settings or, uh, you know, what have you, that they thought there could be a really great game there, but it just wouldn't be Assassin's Creed enough for our liking. Because it seems like they got really excited about this Ancient Greece game, and they knew it was going so far back in time that the, after Origins, they couldn't ham fist any Assassin stuff into it. So they leaned into that. And you also wonder if it's Odyssey and Assassin's Creed Adventure, how much of the very few things that are Assassin's Creed stick around? I bet you there's no modern day in that game. You know what I mean? I bet you there's not a lot of Isu in that game, potentially. Right. Because those would be exactly the kind of shackles that they would theoretically be right. free of by not branding it Assassin's sure. Creed. For sure, and you could do settings that don't need to requ- that don't need to necessitate parkour because you don't really need parkour. Right. Unfortunately, I think with the ultimate decision they made on Odyssey and with how Valhalla has turned out, I think they've they've come to a place where the actual lines of the brand are flexible enough that they could probably get away with anything more or less, and still have people buy it and play. Pretty much. Maybe not with us, the fans, but. You know, we are not the general gaming public, and our needs are more specific than theirs, unfortunately. Yeah, it's interesting to think with the, um, what was I going to say? Holy shit. You're like, this isn't in my outline. (laughs) (laughs) I color-coded it and everything. (laughs) I did. I I gave, like, revelations like a purple. Uh that's okay. that's so horny. I don't know what I was gonna say. Fuck it. Well, I've <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Anyway, yeah, that's that's you could just end there. That's a, that's a plenty good spot to end. <laughs> if if you guys have any additional things that may have been cut that you know about that we didn't mention here, uh, leave them in the comments. And you know what? Fuck it. We'll do a part three. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said at the beginning, if anything of this is like just completely dead wrong, you know, whatever. I mean, I, at, the, at the end of the day, a lot of it's hypothetical too. You yeah. know, uh, we just had a lot of fun discussing what could have been. And, and you know what? Sometimes discussing what could have been makes you sad, but sometimes it can make <laughs> you happy. Like in this situation. That is quite possibly my favorite Tim anomaly yet. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> <laughs> If you like the show, we really, really appreciate it if you leave a comment on our YouTube channel video upload of the episode. Assuming you're listening to it on YouTube, give us a like, give us a comment, subscribe if you're not subscribed, which apparently 30% of you listening to this are not. So fix that immediately, please. I mean, look, I understand why you're not subscribed, but just please. I don't. I don't get it at all. (laughs) We're a great podcast. We deserve your Uh, subscription. (laughs) Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. You know, from from th- this this Tim anomaly appreciates it, but 
you know, maybe, maybe maybe there's another one like that really doesn't appreciate it. And that's why you should tweet at us at Hookblade on Twitter. To get access to the other Tim Anomaly. About what was your favorite Tim Anomaly this week. <laughs> and <laughs> Hold on, wait, wait. I think I have one more. Let, let me do um let me do Ethiopian. No, please don't. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> that, that was what I was going to do. <laughs> oh, I'm Oy, sorry. Isn't it great? Being in Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's my favorite Tim and <laughs> Also, we have a Facebook page. Like our Facebook page if you like to do that. Like our Facebook page if you like to like Facebook pages. If you like liking Facebook pages, like our <laughs> Facebook page. It's called the Hook, <laughs> Hook Face Pod Book. <laughs> I might change it to that now, actually. But yeah, that's it. We really appreciate your guys listening and supporting the show. I've been the hook. And I have been the blade. And with that, good night. Good night. And the blade, so you can use one or the other. An elegant design. Elegant design. Elegant design.